Okay, I could ask uh, all of our dignitaries here to have a seat. Uh, it is my duty to call this uh, meeting to order. I feel like it's almost like a, a hearing or something in, <laughs> in the U.S. Congress. Uh, but and I, I, since I'm the first to speak, I get to use the, the best line of the evening, which is, we will, oh, want you all to turn your cell phones on, please. <laughs> Um, well, for the <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry I stepped on your lines, guys. But my name is Jim Hollifield. Those of you who don't know me, I see a lot of new people here that I have not met before and a lot of Tower Center uh, members and stalwarts. But I'm a professor here and director of the Tower Center. And uh, it, we're delighted to be hosting this uh, highly informative uh, event this evening. Uh, with, uh, along with a couple of partners, the SMU Center for Presidential History uh, 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 and Jeff Engel, who's behind me here, who is the director of that center and the moderator. I'll say more about him in just a minute. Uh, we're delighted to be here in the Lyle School of Engineering. Um, beautiful facility. And I want to give a special uh, note of thanks to our new colleague, Fred Chang, who's here somewhere. Uh, Fred is uh, the, the new Lyle Chair at SMU in Cybersecurity, and he'll be joining us full-time in January. I know he just flew in from Washington, D.C., where he was called to testify before the U.S. House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and I'm assured by him that he they have now solved the problems with healthcare.gov, I'm told. So... <laughs> So you all can jump online you, while you're sitting here <laughs> and, uh, and, and sign up for health insurance. Um, so, uh, but we're not going to talk about health care tonight. We're going to talk about uh, security and intelligence gathering. And I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to turn the program over now uh, to my colleague, uh, Jeff Engel. Uh, I can't list all of the many, many books that he's written on the presidency, but he's one of the great scholars of the presidency and a special, specialist on U.S. foreign policy uh, and director of the new Center for Presidential History here at SMU. So, Jeff, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you indeed, and welcome to all of you, our guests here this evening, and indeed my thanks to the the Tower Center and the Center for Presidential History staff and our new colleague Fred Chang and also uh, those at the Bobby Lyle School of Engineering here for coming together this evening for this discussion of what I think we all agree are some of the most pressing issues facing our country today. Now these intellectual centers on campus have tonight come together for really a singular mission because they all share that mission in their daily work. It is to make academic work relevant beyond the ivory tower, relevant to the critical political and policy debates of our day, relevant as guides to our students, our leaders, and our citizenry as they strive to, to study, to shape, and to lead the country in through and through the 21st century and for this vibrant democracy that we all share. Indeed, tonight I think we gather for one of the key responsibilities of a citizenry in a vibrant democracy. We gather to learn, to discuss, and to debate. In fact, as John F. Kennedy once said, and I think it's most appropriate to have a Kennedy quote this week in particular, as Kennedy once said, quote, too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Tonight then, ultimately, I think we're here to think. We're here to think about the delicate balance between security and civil liberties, a balance that the people of this country in large measure have faced during wartime since the days of the Continental Congress. There were, let me just give you a quick list, the Alien and Sedition Act signed by President John Adams. There was, of course, Lincoln's famous suspension of habeas corpus during the American Civil War. There was Woodrow Wilson's crackdown on free speech and free expression during World War I. 
And I think more famous still, there was Franklin Roosevelt's internment of Japanese American citizens during World War II, to say nothing of the McCarthyite anti-communist witch hunts of the 1940s and 50s. Repeatedly, it would seem, almost like clockwork, when Americans have gone to war, their civil liberties have come under assault as well. Not, I should stress, by malicious tyrants at home, but rather, and this is important, by a government that is just desperate to confront the clear and present danger that it then faced. A government that was temporarily, at least, more interested in safety than in constitutional liberties. Now, history also suggests that time and again, these liberties are largely won back through debate, through legal challenges, through the political pressure of an active citizenry, once the national peril has passed. In a sense, peace brings a return to normalcy. But see, there's the real problem for the 21st century, because if the pendulum of security versus civil liberties swings violently during wartime to peacetime, returning in times of peace, then what are we to do with our unusual wars of the 21st century? Wars that are not declared by Congress, wars that are not fought for territory so much as for ideas, and wars in which the battlegrounds are not just lines on the map. In fact, they're rarely lines on the map, but they're more often in the netherworld of cyberspace. These wars are 21st century wars. They simply will not have the clear and decisive USS Missouri battleship surrender moment when the world could truly come to know in one single moment that the war had come to a close. 12 years after the awful events of September 11th, and let me remind you, it has actually been 12 years since 9-11, we continue to ask ourselves, I think, a single omnipresent question, which is, can there ever truly be an end to a war on terror? Indeed, if America is today in a permanent state of semi-war, here in the post 9 11 world, as commentators on both sides of the political spectrum, on all throughout the political spectrum, are concerned about and argue. If it is in that state of semi permanent war, and if we must, for the sake of security, be willing to sacrifice some of our individual liberties for the collective good, then what are we to do with the old paradigm of the pendulum swinging and returning to normal once peace returns again? For at the end of the day, I think we will all agree that. If war does not end, how can liberty truly return? Tonight we're here to wrestle with these uncomfortable questions, with a particular focus on an element of American national security, the National Security Agency. Founded in 1952 with a mission of conducting signal intelligence while simultaneously safeguarding American communications, this agency long worked in the shadows of the broader American intelligence community. It was by and large a secret, and the truth is that's how its leaders liked it. Uh, they liked the idea that they were secret. Indeed, people in Washington used to joke, though it's a joke that of course had a basis in reality, that NSA actually stood for no such agency. <laughs> now that all changed, I think perhaps forevermore, when a short-term contractor by the name of Edward Snowden decided to pilfer and then to publicize many of the NSA secrets, including its widespread efforts in mass data collection and data mining. The political uproar, and of course the diplomatic uproar as well, continues to this day and with no foreseeable end in sight. Now the NSA's champions, we must admit, argue that hidden behind a veil of secrecy, this agency, as with the broader intelligence community, has done a remarkable job in safeguarding the nation from homeland attack since the awful day of 9-11. Critics, on the other hand, charge that civil liberties are the cost of this security, leading, I think, to a rather profound idea that the day that the Snowden information hit the airwaves, that was the day, for most Americans, when the 9-11 experience truly ended. For on September 12th of 2001, when the rubble in New York and Washington was still smoldering. And when the Patriot Act was only but the German of an idea, few, if anyone in the country, would even think of hamstringing the efforts of those who would safeguard the homeland from another attack. Fully 12 years later, 
as memories of that terrible day fade, replaced, I think, in large part by troubling images that came since. Images of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and drone strikes. The national and indeed international enthusiasm to defeat the faceless enemy of terrorism, no matter the cost, seems largely to have faded as well. So, where does our broader national security debate and intelligence community go from here? And where, in fact, does the pendulum of liberty versus national security swing in this ongoing 21st century? Now, as Jim mentioned, we could not possibly have better guides tonight for understanding and discussing these questions. As we learn, I think, to debate and to think, as John Kennedy implored us to do. We have, in order, a top official from the NSA, and off-cited as an authority on, uh, excuse me, uh, here to separate fact from fiction when it comes to the agency's policies and dealings. We also have an SMU law professor, long published, long versed, and off-cited on issues of national security versus civil liberties. And we also have an SMU political scholar whose path-breaking work on intelligence and national security makes him truly one of the nation's experts in this field. Now let me tell you how we're going to run things tonight. I've asked each of our speakers to give us about 10 minutes to lay the framework, a groundwork, a base for what they're going to tell us and discuss over the rest of the evening. After that, they will have a few moments to discuss, debate, and play with e each other before we turn it over to you. Now my job is to make sure they play nice and that you play nice because we really want to hear what you have to say. The whole purpose is to engage the public in this debate, you, the SMU community. So please sit tight. There's no reason to stand up, no reason to move at this point, because when it comes time for questions, we will bring microphones to you. And there will be plenty of time for questions. So with that, let me turn our attention over to our first speaker, who has flown down to Washington to start things off tonight. John DeLong is Director of Compliance at the National Security Agency, having previously served as Deputy Director of the NSA's Commercial Solutions Center and as Deputy Director of the National Cybersecurity Division at the Department of Homeland Security. He has also taught at the National Cryptologic School and graduated magna cum laude from Harvard with degrees in physics and mathematics, and then returning once more to Harvard for his law degree. Now, he has been kind enough to come down here and take time out of his remarkably busy schedule to talk to us tonight. So please, if you will, uh, join me in welcoming John DeLong. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, first, a, a warm thank you to all of you for being here, um, to SMU, to Dallas, to Texas for bringing me down here. Um, really, uh, it's great to be coming down. They asked me, um, to come down here, and I, I immediately jumped at the opportunity, um, both to be on a panel with, with um, the uh, folks here, but also to hear directly from all of you. I used to come down here to visit my grandparents um, in Texas, so it brings back good memories. Um, as, uh, as Jeff said, I, I really did want to come down, um, give you a little context for, for what NSA is, who I am, just so you know who this NSA guy is who's sitting in front of you. Um, you, can, you can anchor there. Um, but also maybe to separate a little fact from fiction, um, to the extent we can, we can um, talk to that, I'll, I'll do my best to make sure I answer all your questions and um, engage in some lively discussion to keep you all uh, both informed and, and entertained, I guess, if, if you will. Um, a little background about me. Uh, I, um, I was one of those kids who liked to take things apart and put things back together, um, anything my parents would give me, um, hopefully always returning it back together. Uh, so I kind of had a science-y background, if you will, an engineering background. It's nice to be in this room. Um, and uh, so after college, where I, I got a math and physics degree, I went to the National Security Agency, um, an actual agency that I didn't find out about until my senior year in college. Um, so you know, if you to play off your uh, no such agency thing, maybe the new acronym is not secret anymore. Um, so, uh, so. <laughs> I wrote that down. That came to me as you were talking. Uh, so I, I have very short remarks here, as you can see. Um, but uh, so I joined the I joined NSA pre 9/11 um, and uh, lived through the events of 9/11 at, at NSA. And if you want to, I can talk a little bit about what that was like. Um, in 2002, then I returned to law school. Uh, you, you don't go long in the government, especially the federal government. 
um, without interacting with lawyers and policymakers. Uh, it is a very heavily regulated um, place. Um, the NSA is no different. I hope to uh, give you a little bit of idea of what those are. Um, and so in law school, I took every class I could on privacy and criminal law and national security, um, Fourth Amendment, whatever you could find that sort of was in the space of, of courts and wiretaps and all those kinds of things. And so at that time, actually, there wasn't a lot of courses in national security law, per se. Um, there's just an explosion now. And I think that's actually a really positive um, development for our, for our nation, for our country, for um, striking that right balance, that getting both security and privacy correct. Um, so I came back to the National Security Agency in 2005. Um, uh, spent a lot of time at the intersection of laws, policies, technology, operations, people, if you will. It really all comes back to people. I hope to give you a little bit of that context today. Um, you know, really, um, we can talk about the technology, we can talk about the laws, but technology is made by people. Laws are made by people. Um, and so there's really a human element to all of this that I hope to give you a little context about. Um, as uh, Jeff said, I went to um, the Department of Homeland Security, working cybersecurity, another area. Um, rich with policy, technology, operational um, um, privacy concerns. Uh, then went um, uh, to the um, Commercial Solutions Center. And then very quickly in 2009, um, I was asked to lead a team to study NSA's oversight and compliance framework. And three months later, I was asked to take on the role of um, Director of Compliance at the National Security Agency. Um, a little bit of context for that role. Um, that role is very much like you might hear about as a chief compliance officer um, in any kind of regulated industry. So whether that's banking or, you know, you mentioned healthcare, um, healthcare, uh, anything that works with regulations, often um, data, uh, things where their rules must be followed and then it must be accounting for how those rules are followed. Um, so in 2009, NSA stood up this position called the Director of Compliance. It was actually written into law by Congress in the Fiscal Year 10 Intel Authorization Act. Um, my focus is on those laws, those policies, those regulations that protect U.S. person privacy. We're going to talk about some of those today. Um, those come from Congress uh, in the form of statutes. They come from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in the form of orders. Um, they come from the Attorney General in, in the context of minimization procedures and other privacy protecting procedures. Um, they come even internally um, from the Department of Defense or the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, maybe not all household words, but we'll, we'll talk about some of them. Um, so that's kind of my background. I've been doing this since 2009. Um, if you look deeply in the documents that have been released, um, you know, whether by the government or not by the government, um, they all came from the government at some point, so you know, they're all ultimately uh, from the government. Um, uh, there was just a big, a big document um, set released by the ODNI. Um, you can actually see some of the kind of 2009 um, events, and I'd be happy to talk, talk through those. I'm guessing we'll get a question about them. Um, so here we are. Uh, you know, it, it, that's my background. NSA's background, as Jeff said, goes back to 1952. Um, right? We were established to do communications intelligence, signals intelligence. Um, nation states like to work things out, um, obviously, in public, above, and, and through negotiation. But nation states have always wanted to make sure they had a, a way to understand strategic and tactical surprise um, of foreign governments, of, of foreign actors. Obviously, um, in the terrorism context, that same thing applies, right? We want to make sure we provide information that's useful, that's um, responsive to our policymaker and our military commander's needs. Um, so here we are in 2013. Um, it's great to be here. I wanted to focus my remarks on kind of the way we might frame and, and approach some of the topics we're going to talk about today. Um, seems appropriate for a university. Um, as, uh, you know, there's lots of different things we can talk about. We can talk about the, um, the uh, telephony metadata counterterrorism program. We can talk about some of the other things you've read about with names everywhere from PRISM to whatever. You, know, you fill in your cover term. Um, we've, we've, uh, we can talk about it. Um, but the way really much uh, I do in compliance and, and my compliance officers, and I think it might be useful to approach it, is really to think about sort of four fundamental questions or things that we want to um, make sure we have answers to and understand. And then one real um, distinction, I think, that's going to be increasingly important, especially as we talk about technology. So the first, the first framing issue would be, for any activity we talk about, where is its source of law, right? Where is its source of regulation? Who made that, um, right? What is, the, what is the actual text of it? Where is it found? So for example, for the telephony metadata program, the counterterrorism program, 
That's Congress, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the Executive Branch, through the Attorney General and Department of Justice. Um, obviously, and, and think about those laws and policies as written and how they focus on privacy, um, how they achieve that, both privacy and, and security. Second then would be um, maybe more at the policy layer, but what is the kind of reason behind all these laws and policies? People don't just make laws and policies because they can, they make them for a reason. There's a policy, there's some policy behind all this. Um, so kind of what's the reason behind the rule and how is it responsive to the needs of policy makers, military commanders, et cetera. Um, the third, and this is where the rubber meets the road for me, is, and especially focused on the NSA, um, how is NSA accountable um, to those rules, those laws, those policies, right? What is evidence of NSA as being an accountable organization, as being a learning organization, um, and as being an organization that is responsive to inquiries from its overseers, from all three branches of government, and then increasingly right to the public. That's why we're here today, or why I'm here today, I guess, from DC. Um, and then the third is kind of getting back to those overseers across all three branches of government. Um, how are they kept informed? What is their oversight role? Um, so you kind of go again from number one, law and, and policy as, as expressed and written, to kind of policy maker, what is the reason behind this? Three, the kind of compliance, accountability, NSA as an organization that's learning, and then third, or sorry, fourth, how is, um, how is NSA's oversight? What is all that? Um, obviously, we've, we've lived a lot with congressional and, and court oversight. We're now focused a lot more on the public interaction, and that's something. Um, so then the last thing I would say is that distinction, um, and, and it kind of goes into the probably, um, there is a big distinction between the capability to do something and the actual use of that capability. So um, I took a car from the airport to um, the hotel today, and if I were to only look at the speedometer on that car, I would be shocked, right? Because I looked at it, and it went up to a pretty high miles per hour, right? But the driver did not go that fast, right? The driver largely followed the speed limit, right? And why did the driver follow that speed limit? Because there's laws, right? Because there's a reason why you would follow those laws because the driver knows, has his own incense, as a driver has a sense of compliance and accountability, and also knows that they're subject to oversight. So they're gonna hear a lot, and we've talked a lot about technology out there. Um, I think it's very important to separate, even at the operation and technology level, the capacity, the capability to do something versus how it's actually used, how it's regulated by the law, how it's regulated by policy, how NSA holds itself accountable, and then how NSA is held accountable externally. So I, I, you know, not every issue we talk about today will be framed in those four things and then kind of the um, capability versus um, use of that capability, but I just wanted to use that as an example. So with that, I will um, open up for, I mean, open up for the rest of the panel and then we'll work things through. I have, you know, like I said, I have short remarks, but I have lots more we can talk about. So thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. Uh, and let the record show that the people at Enterprise Rental Car appreciate your prudence. <laughs> so, uh, our next speaker, <laughs> so you say, <laughs> are we tracking that data? Uh, our next speaker is Jeffrey Kahn, Associate Professor of Law here at SMU, where he teaches and writes on American constitutional law, Russian law, human rights, and counterterrorism. His most recent book is Mrs. Shipley's Ghost, The Right to Travel and Terrorist Watch List published this year by the University of Michigan Press. It's a critical and penetrating study of the US government's no-fly list. Now, he's previously written on Russian and European human rights. He served as a law clerk of the United States District Court, and he also was a trial attorney for the US Department of Justice. And I should add that we're particularly happy to have him down here, down south, uh, because he's also currently this year on leave uh, as a visiting fellow at McGill University. So, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I should add, uh, Mrs. Shipley's Ghost is available in fine bookstores everywhere. It makes a, <laughs> it makes a lovely Christmas gift. Uh, that was left out, but uh, I am very glad to be here. I, um, as, as Jeff said, I am interested in two broad areas. I'm interested in American law and civil liberties and national security, and I'm interested in Russian law. Uh, and until Edward Snowden came along, it was very hard to connect those two. Uh, but, but now I think I've got an argument for my dean. Uh, 
what I'd like to do, and you, you couldn't ask for a better framework to look at these issues than the one that uh, John uh, just presented to you. Uh, and our agreement, despite what I think will emerge as our disagreement about different aspects of that, brings me to the first point I want to make of three points. This is sort of a freestanding point. Then I want to give you a quote uh, from John Dingle, and I want to take that apart, that quote apart in two different ways. Uh, and the first point, the freestanding point is, it's not like a battle, liberty versus security. It's not as if on the one side we have the United States government, security, and on the other side, the rest of us, or whoever is in my camp, liberty. I don't think that there is any debate that the First Amendment is valuable, that the Fourth Amendment is valuable, the amendments in between them are valuable, around them are valuable. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a matter of dispute about the existence of these rights or the value of these rights. And so in a sense, there's a false contest when you present it as liberty versus security. Not to say that there aren't trade-offs, but the first point is, I don't think that there's malice of forethought. I don't think, I don't believe from my research on terrorist watch lists uh, that there is a, a, a dark conspiratorial group out there that is intent on eroding our civil liberties. It's just a silly sort of an argument. There's no malice. To say that there's no malice is not to say that there's not bias. There is institutional bias in every institution, universities included. Uh, and this I want to come around to in the end of my remarks, this idea of institutional bias. But the first point is no malice of forethought. This, this contest isn't really a contest. At the same time, it's not a pendulum either, or at least it's not a pendulum with a uh, uniform and regular swing. So here's the quote. John Dingell said it, a uh, longstanding congressman from Michigan, uh, my home state, uh, and he did not say it in the context of national security law or in the context of national security. He said it at a congressional hearing in 1983 about administrative law. And he said this, and please forgive me because it's a little bit vulgar. I attribute that to Congressman Dingell. <laughs> he said, tell you what, I'll let you write the substance. You let me write the procedure and I'll screw you every time. You let me write the substance. Or I'll let you write the substance. You let me write the procedure, and I'll screw you every time. So let's take that apart, the first part. I'll let you write the substance. In this context, what's the substance? The substance are your rights. Who are we? Well, we change in various times and places, and how we write the substance changes in various times and places. We start out with a constitution written at a certain time, in a certain place, by a certain group, and it provides you with certain rights. A right to a fair trial, a right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, a whole panoply of rights. But there's flexibility built in there. What's fair? In what context? What makes it fair? What's unreasonable? Does the standard change reasonable to unreasonable depending on some context or another? Now there are other rights I'm sure you may think you have, you may indeed have, that aren't found in the Bill of Rights in that black and white uh, section. You have a right to privacy. You have a right to travel, I think. You don't find that so easily stated, but it's there. And that also changes over time, just like what's reasonable may change, or what's fair may change. Now, sometimes it changes by statute. Congress writes a law for a particular purpose, on a particular issue, sets up an agency, sets up a, a series of protections, creates a right, like a freedom to information. And that's more or less amendable easily, more easily than the Constitution. Uh, and here I get back to the pendulum point. Sometimes we write laws or we interpret the Constitution in a context and then the context changes. But the law doesn't change. The law is slow and it's ponderous. And notwithstanding the fact that the Patriot Act was written in about six weeks, or at least 
promulgated in about six weeks. Generally, law works best when it works slowly, ponderously, by accretion, building on its past precedents, reflecting on differences case by case or uh, amendment by amendment, and it grows and it develops. All well and good. But sometimes it grows and develops in times of terrible crisis. War. 9-11. And as a result, we can see the pendulum changing, shifting back and forth over time. But the first point I want to make to you is the pendulum doesn't always return to the same place. Take the right to travel. I would expect that most people in this room would believe you have a right to move about. Part of being a free citizen in a free democracy is to move about when you want to. You don't need an internal passport, but you do need an external one. Nobody here, I would think, thinks that you should be allowed to leave the country and return willy-nilly without a passport, without any informational document at all. Well, where do you get that belief? It's a new belief. Because until 1941, you didn't need one. It was a discretionary document. You could have one if you wanted one, but you didn't need one. But now we don't think in those terms, in part because over the course of the 20th century mainly, uh, a lot of our views on the relationship of the individual to the state changed. External factors, internal factors. But they changed, and they don't always go back to the same place. Your right to travel today is not what it was in 1941, not what it was in 1841. Now, I talked about the effect of crises and current events on the law, but technology also has an effect on the law. Uh, and technology moves a lot faster than law, a lot faster. So when we think about how the law sets up authorities, and how the law creates oversight, and how the law establishes institutional relationships, we have to remember they were set at a time and immediately became outdated. Now that would be fine, but for the second point I would like to make. That quote is, I'll let you write the substance, you let me write the procedure, and I'll screw you every time. The, the quote speaks for itself. You can see how it goes. I get to decide what's a fair trial. I get to decide whether you have a right to counsel. I get to decide what's reasonable or unreasonable in a particular context. Maybe through a statute that says you've got to get a warrant for this type of investigation or surveillance. Or maybe in this context, special needs, at a border, in, a, in an emergency, you don't need to follow that procedure but I can strengthen or erode your right as I wish to by manipulating the procedure. Now, who am I? In our society, I, the I who writes the procedure, is usually not the same I who writes the substance. And Justice Scalia is very fond of saying that although the Bill of Rights is all well and good, what really protects your rights what really protects you in our society is structure. The structural relationships of institutions in our society, the checks and balances that you learn about in a high school civics class, that's what protects your rights because substance and procedure don't get to be decided by the same group. You've got Congress, you've got the courts, you've got an executive branch. That separation of powers is extremely important. And to get back to Russia, where you can find lots of rights, like the right to travel, and a right to a fair trial, and a right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures, you don't find the structure. You find a very unified pyramid of control. When we reflect on the structures we've created, sometimes in times of peace, sometimes in times of war, we have to be careful to think about those structures as rights-enabling institutions as well. And uh, with regard to our surveillance systems and our terrorist watch lists and other national security instruments, too often, my position is, you don't have that separation of powers. You don't have one group writing the procedures 
and another group determining what the right is. That is typically done inside, in one institution, or in one institution overseen in a very limited way, in an unusually limited way by another institution, but in ways that don't provide that protection of structure uh, that Justice Scalia emphasizes often in his remarks, and what I think is essential if you want any of those other rights uh, to be as valuable as I think we all wish them to be. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> it's not often that we have Congressman Dingell and Justice Scalia in the same talk, so that was really well done. So, uh, Our last speaker for the, uh, for the evening, before we begin the debate, discussion, is Josh Rovner, who is new to SMU this year. And let me tell you that no one is happier that he is here than I am. He is the John Goodwin Toward Distinguished Chair in International Politics and National Security while teaching in SMU's Political Science Department. His Cornell University Press book, Fixing the Facts, National Security and the Politics of Intelligence, has won more awards than I could possibly list here if you still want to have time to ask questions. He is an expert on intelligence, on military strategy, on nuclear strategy as well, and we are thrilled to have him on board. Josh? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's terrific that you're all here tonight. This is a very important discussion. And it's important to, to approach this from a number of different angles. So it's, it's really great to have a, a professional historian here from the Center for Presidential History. It, it's great to have a law professor as well as a, as a practitioner so that we can really try to, to tackle this. And uh, special thanks to, to the Lyle School of Engineering for, for making the venue possible and for helping us in this important uh, event. Uh, the, the metaphor that's been going around so far is the pendulum metaphor, and not everybody likes it, but I, I, I think in one respect it is quite accurate. The, the, the public attitudes towards intelligence do swing on a, on a pendulum, and it's a, it's a pretty radical pendulum. So think back to, to, the, to the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, the public opinion towards the intelligence community was very negative. Right? There was intense criticism of, of pretty much all of the agencies for failing to prevent the attack as the saying goes, for failing to pr connect the dots. There were some who were questioning whether or not the billions of dollars we invest in intelligence was worth it if they couldn't do this essential task. Right? And the prevailing view of, of the intelligence community was that it was totally incompetent. Right? Well, fast forward 12 years later, and what's the prevailing view of intelligence this year? Well, the prevailing view is not that it's incompetent, but that it is so competent <laughs> that it's, it's somehow sinister, right? It knows where all of the dots are. It knows where your dots are, and it can connect them, right? Both of these things can't be true. Right? It's not possible that the intelligence community is simultaneously incompetent and so terrifyingly competent that they are going to intrude on your civil liberties and, and learn everything about your lives, right? So what is, is the middle ground? And by having a discussion like this, in which we have a lot of different perspectives on, on the question, I'm hoping we can have a, a more sober debate because the, 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 the outcome of this debate really is important, right? Because we have very important policy decisions to make about the role of intelligence moving forward. And better to have those decisions made in an atmosphere of, of calm deliberation than uh, extreme shifts or swings in the pendulum. So, so far we've, we've heard of, of a couple of these perspectives of looking at uh, the NSA and intelligence more broadly. We've heard about what Jeff Engel was talking about, this essential um, uh, dynamic of, of performing secret intelligence in a transparent democracy. These things always exist in tension, right? and this is, this is an important way of looking at the issue. We've also heard about the, the, the nature of oversight and, and the intelligence community's relationship with its congressional and policy overseers. And we have finally just heard about the law and whether or not uh, the, the law covers uh, intelligence in a time of rapid technological progress. It's a fascinating and critical question. I want to situate the debate slightly differently. Um, I teach strategy, so I want to think about the, the strategic value of intelligence and raise what I think are some uncomfortable truths. Most of the discussion of intelligence this summer, since the Snowden uh, affair began, 
has been about whether or not the NSA is acting legally, whether or not it's acting appropriately, whether or not it's acting effectively. And I've been very surprised to see a lack of discussion of the actual strategic value of, of intelligence versus the strategic cost of doing it wrong. Right? Now, nobody would disagree that there is strategic value in performing signals intelligence against American enemies. This is not controversial. If the NSA was simply looking at terrorist organizations abroad, completely in foreign lands, nobody would, would, would mind at all. The more difficult and problematic questions come when intelligence starts to look at allies and American citizens. Right? So it's worth asking, is there strategic value in spying on allies? Is there strategic value on spying on your own citizens? We know there are costs, we know there are risks, and we know there are dangers, but what is the value of these? And here's where the debate gets tricky and sometimes uncomfortable. So in the abstract, what, what is the value of spying on one's uh, allies? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you would do this. Right? Very, very valid reasons why you would spy on, on one's allies. For one thing, you might want to know just how vulnerable they are to espionage. Right? And, and we have a lot of historical examples of this. Right? Famously, uh, British intelligence in World War II surveilled on the United States, leading Winston Churchill to sort of delicately tell President Roosevelt, you might want to tighten up the ship a little bit. Right? This is an example of an ally spying on another ally for a very good reason. Uh, the United States more recently has done this as well. Uh, in the Vietnam War, the United States spied on its South Vietnamese enemy uh, because it was somewhat concerned about uh, leaks and penetrations coming out of Saigon. So this is one reason why it's done. It might make us uncomfortable, but this is one histor historical purpose of it. Why else would you spy on an ally? Why else would you, for instance, surveil somebody's cell phone? Well, sometimes your allies have access to third parties that you lack. Sometimes, sometimes uh, foreign leaders have access to sources that you desperately want to know more about. For instance, if an ally has a very good network on, say, terrorist groups working in North Africa, and they're somewhat uneasy about sharing all of that information with you, you might have very strong and powerful incentives to surveil your ally in order to find out about your enemy. This is a second reason why you might perform this kind of surveillance. And and a third reason to, to, to spy on one's allies is you might want to know what their bargaining position is. Right? You might want to know what their in, intentions are in multilateral negotiations. This has a long history. Right? And I'll give you one historical example from the 1920s. There's a large arms control conference, the Washington uh, Naval Conference in the early 20s to determine the post-World War I levels of acceptable naval expenditures. And the United States was very interested in its wartime allies' perspectives on how far they were willing to go. And so the State Department uh, used signals intelligence on its, on, on its partners at the time, most notably Japan, to surveil them. Right? And this worked to US benefit. This gave the United States negotiating advantage in those negotiations. We are currently doing this again. I'm not saying we're spying on, on allies for this purpose, but we are involved in some very delicate multilateral negotiations, again, on similar issues dealing with arms control. It may be in the US interest to find out what our allies' bottom line is. They may not be willing to share that with us, and that leads to a difficult decision about how badly we want to know. Right? So there are, there, are, uh, there are some reasons to spy on allies. Now, obviously, there are costs. Right? If, you, if your actions have been revealed, you risk a serious loss of prestige, you risk embarrassment, you, you, miss, you, you risk a fissure in your alliance relations. Right? There are serious potential diplomatic costs to pay. But in strategic terms, this is not an easy answer. Right? There are times in which the benefits may exceed those costs and risks. Finally, perhaps the most controversial as, as, of all, is there strategic value in performing intelligence against one's own citizens? This is very difficult. Now, in the context of the war on terrorism, again, it would be nice if terrorist organizations or US enemies were completely foreign, if there were no links between the United States and, and, and foreign operators. But after 9-11, the big concern, and not just within the intelligence community, but in the broader academic security studies community and in the public, was that there were transnational links. 
between people living in the United States and living abroad. And the question is, how do you understand what those links are? How do you reveal those networks? How do you uncover them? And how do you do that in a way in which you're trying to stay true to the law and true to your democratic values? Not an easy proposition. And, and, I, and I am sure that there are some within the intelligence community and within the policy community that were willing to err on the side of doing too much right, because the strategic value was that high. Right? So there, there are reasons uh, for, for the purposes of counterterrorism. Uh, counter there is also another reason which has sort of been lost this summer, which is counterintelligence. All of the discussion about the NSA this, this summer has been about terrorism and counterterrorism. But terrorists are not the only targets of the intelligence community. Right? There, there are many targets out there. There are, there are rival states. There are rival great powers who are trying to grow and compete with the United States, some of whom I, shockingly perform espionage against the United States and against American citizens and American government and American industry. And the intelligence community has strong incentives to figure out who those people are and where they have penetrated. And doing that without taking the risk of surveilling one's own citizens is very difficult, if not impossible. Right? So there is strategic, there's, there's a number of reasons why uh, uh, intelligence against one's citizens might be tempting and might actually have some strategic purpose. Obviously, once again here, there are huge risks involved. Right? If, you, if you go too far down this line and you're too tempted to spy on one's own citizens, even for the right reasons, you might break the law. You might violate your core democratic beliefs. Right? But we shouldn't ignore the fact that there is a trade-off involved here. Right? That this is not simply a, a, a legal debate, and it's not simply a, a debate about governance and about uh, upholding our, our values. It's a strategic debate. And ultimately, where you come down on these questions is a matter of policy. This is not simply a debate about the behavior of intelligence community. This is a debate about what policies we like. Are we willing to take the risks uh, as a government and as a society of doing too much espionage because we believe that the, the threat is that uh, important? Right? This, is, this is a debate to be had at policy circles and in public, which is a reason which is why it is so important that we are here today. So once again, thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. <clears throat> Thank you, Josh, and thank you to all of you. Um, let me make one observation stemming from Josh's remarks. Uh, I've long contended that the most universal and powerful force in the universe is irony. And there is an irony, I think, in Josh's example that Winston Churchill notified Franklin Roosevelt that there were leaks in the American security apparatus, given that, as we all know now, it was, of course, a British member of the nuclear delegation that gave the most secrets to the Soviets. So, irony. So, gentlemen, uh, let me throw a question to all of you as a way to kick off our discussion. And that's simply this. You know, this is a complex issue. It's been in the news time and time again, especially over the last several months. There has been position after counter position offered. What has the media given the public right, and what has it gotten wrong? What does the public understand correctly and what does the public really need to be educated about to really understand not just the headline, but what's below? Discuss. I'll give you one <laughs> All at the same time? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you one example from, from this morning. I was, I was on a plane this morning, and I, I got one of those complimentary USA Todays from, from, from the hotel. I get on the plane, and I open it up, and, and, and the headline, I, I'm probably slightly getting this wrong, but. Uh, NSA to citizens, bug off, was the headline. And it was a story about how citizens had been making increasingly, uh, an increasing normal formal request of the NSA for basic questions like, are you spying on me? What do you know about my <laughs> life? And the NSA sends out a form letter in response to all of these requests, right? Which, which says very little, it's, it's mostly, it's entirely boilerplate. And this rubs people the wrong way, right? Now, the, the, the article did a good job uh, after laying out the, the, the complaints of issuing the NSA's response and getting good quotes and explaining why it is that they can't be fully forthcoming and they're, they're struggling very hard to handle this avalanche of, of, of requests. But the headline didn't say that. The headline said, NSA to citizens bug off, 
Right? So if you're just reading the headlines, or if you're just getting little snippets from cable news, uh, you might not understand the, the complexity of it. And then one other, and I, I'm curious to hear your, your views yeah. as well, but one other issue on this is that these are highly technical debates. This is not an easy issue to, to, to understand. Right? And so the more that the media can, can really dig into the technology and understand what, what practices are going on, I think the better. So, I mean, just to kind of play off that a little bit, I, I, uh, I make it a routine thing to read the, the news because you know, I'm always I'm talking, to, I'll be in front of Congress on Thursday, um, and I'm sure the Wednesday news will inform that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so two headlines about literally the same documents that, that came out yesterday. Um, first headline is NSA documents show NSA repeatedly made and repeatedly broke promises. Okay. Same documents, different headline, NSA reported its own violations to Intel Court in 2009, files show. Okay. So you, know, you, you take different views of that as what's an accountable organization, what's a learning organization, what's, what's that structure, and I, I mean, I could not agree with you more about the structure point. I think that's absolutely key. If you look at some of the programs, as General Hayden said, you know, I don't think um, folks really understand kind of the, the trifecta that occurs in many of them of Congress, the courts, the executive branch being involved. And I, just the last point I'd make um, is I, I think the, the documents are complex. Um, they're incomplete by definition, right? They're not. Um, and so sometimes there's a um, confusion, again, still between the possible technical capacity or capability to do something, and the, the actual use or the fact that it's not done, or it's done in a different way. Um, and so, for example, there was an article recently that came out um, where paragraph two said this might be used to spy, which is not a word actually in any of the regulations we have, but that's a different story, um, to spy on. And then in 33, paragraph 33, it said, um, actually, it's completely unclear as to how this was used. Right, so that's, you know, you go from paragraph two to paragraph 33. Um, it's, I think, it, you know, if, if I could leave you with one thing, it's, um, you know, be as critical in reading as, and, and, and precise as reading as you would expect me to be as precise in my remarks. Um, because there is a lot out there. Um, you know, this is, this is a complex area technically. Legally, it's a complex area. There's different regulations that apply to different activities. Um, I'm happy to talk through those, but. You know, the, um the press gave us an opportunity and takes a risk. Uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation but for the press. And so as we think about structure, one of the structures we should think about are non-institutional structures like the media, the fourth estate, another structure that is missing in certain countries, a free press, a free press that is able to open up this dialogue, which we just would not be having but for, uh, but for the recent leaks. It's also taking a risk, because with those sorts of sensational headlines, or bug off, which must be a riff on, uh, on uh, that New York mayor. Uh, uh, which one? <laughs> uh, no, 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 uh, the New York mayor in the 60s. Said, he said, uh, no, it, was, it, was a it, was, it wasn't the mayor, it was actually a response in the New York Times headline that said, uh, Nixon to city, Maybe it was Ford. Ford, thank Ford. you. Ford to city, drop dead. Drop dead, yeah. drop dead. It, and by the way, the city didn't. Well, <laughs> and I probably confused Mayor with uh, President Ford because of that other Mayor Ford. <laughs> uh, but they're taking a big risk because those sensational headlines erode trust. And erode not just accuracy, but trust, respect. Uh, a citizen's healthy respect and trust that the government is not separate and apart from us, but is organized by us and for us and responsive to us, ought to be responsive to us. And when you, you get that sort of hook that every uh, journalist learns to use, uh, instead of a more um, conservative uh, and staid sort of headline uh, that seeks to educate, uh, you risk eroding trust, and the more that trust is eroded, the more, the more uh, difficult the whole debate becomes. John, let me ask you a question about oversight, and congressional oversight specifically, since you mentioned you're going up there again later this week. Uh, I think if you could walk us through a little bit of how Congress actually does oversee what the intelligence community does, especially on really complex technical issues, such as are uh, in the news lately, and I think to 
deep, uh, to bury down deep, dig into that a little bit. When Congress has oversight, does all of Congress have oversight, or is it simply the people within the intelligence committees? And can those people in the intelligence committees then take the information to the public? Or is the information too secret, in which case they are bound not to discuss and get public feedback? If you could walk us through a little bit of how this process works, I think that'd be very helpful. So I'll start with kind of a you know, basis of, of how it works in practice and then um, pass it down the line. So. Um, you know, I think the, probably just to set the scene, um, in 1978, Congress the foreign, passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which, which regulated a specific set of activities that Congress at the time, and they've amended this, this act, uh, really they thought would um, uh, be most crucial when thinking about privacy um, concerns for US persons. Um, and so generally, there's, there's multiple sections of that, but generally, if you were to kind of squint and look at all of them, um, as you mentioned, they. Um, they also established the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Intelligence Committees. Um, for example, for the um, uh, 702 Authority, which has been in the press, the PRISM in that, the Senate Judiciary, House Judiciary Committees also have that. With respect to NSA, we're also a Department of Defense component, so we're also overseen by the Senate Armed Services and the House Armed Services Committee, and then obviously you have the Appropriations Committee and all that. So oversight generally comes from a kind of all of Congress in the sense of that's budgetary, that's laws, that's that's everything. If if you're talking about specific to kind of programs and intelligence, um, you know the the intelligence committees, the judiciary committees, because it's a, a very regulated legal um, thing, they they obviously are the the committees um, that that focus more than where the rubber meets the road a lot is. Um, those committees have permanent staff. They're out at, at the National Security Agency. We're out down there briefing them. Um, there's obviously uh, a number of closed hearings. There's been a lot more open hearings lately. I would <coughs> implore you to go uh, watch some of those or, or listen to some of them, um, having sat through some of them. They're really, I think, um, you know, to play off the press. This is, this is amazing to think about um, you know, how wonderful it is to be in the United States where you can have an open hearing on intelligent matters, on intelligence matters, um, kind of involving, right, you know, these very, very weighty issues. Um, so uh, I mean, I'm trying to think how far I got on my, my train there. Um, you know, the way they also write the laws in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the FISA Amendments Act, they also require regular reports. So for example, under the 702 Authority, every six months, the Department of Justice and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence sends the committees, um, essentially, you know, lots of paper, think about that, um, describing um, everything from how the programs work to um, how the compliance programs are structured to um, mistakes we've made and reported to them so that Congress can kind of be um, fully and currently informed of what's going on within the National Security Agency. That obviously applies across the intelligence community, so I don't, you know, there's, there's other aspects. Um, in terms of kind of the broader congressional engagement, I think I'll, I'll pass that, give you all opportunity. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take a shot at it, and, and you correct me where I'm wrong, but um, Words matter, uh, and I don't think that the congressional oversight we're talking about might be the same thing. Uh, because when you say Congress is fully informed, uh, on one level, I would think that should mean the full Congress. That's what was originally intended. Uh, but over the course of time, and for very good reasons, uh, there comes uh, uh, a series of restrictions on who in Congress will be uh, informed and who among each congressperson's staff uh, will be informed. Also for good reasons. I remember interviewing the director of the Terrorist Screening Center and seeing in the morning an unclassified PowerPoint display uh, that he was going to present uh, to, to Congress. And then going to a happy hour on the Hill later that afternoon and seeing the classified version of it uh, by, by a slightly tipsy staffer uh, who was uh, delighted to find out we've been talking to the same guy, uh, but never really bothered to check that I had the same clearance as she did, which mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, and boy did I see in the eyeful. Uh, but there are good reasons not to, uh, to show everything to everybody on the Hill. But even if those are good reasons, that's not the same as fully briefing Congress. Uh, and then the question becomes, if you're partially briefing Congress, some of Congress, some congressmen and congresswomen with or without their staffs, or in a skiff or outside of a skiff, uh, a, a closed compartment where documents cannot leave uh, and notes taken must remain, uh, 
what does it mean to call that oversight? Do we mean the same thing when we say in a congressional hearing, of course uh, we have congressional oversight? Uh, and one side of the table means come over here to this special place, observe, discuss, debate, but don't reveal or talk about it later unless under certain conditions. Or present, as Senator Wyden claims he was presented, a really terrible dilemma about what to do uh, in terms of revealing what he uh, was shown under certain pretty, I think, uh, clear uh, but extreme conditions. Uh, or does it mean uh, oversight in a different way? So just real quick, I think picking up on Josh's point before, I think it's important to separate the structure we have today, right, and the reporting paths and that with discussions about a structure that right, we might talk about, think about, and evolve to, the way it's evolved over time. So I just mm -hmm. want to make sure we're talking about those things in, yes, in know, separate buckets. And, and on, that, on that point specifically, that there is a central problem that, that Jeff raises with, with congressional oversight of intelligence, where you do have a small number of, of representatives and senators who do have access, but they can't really do anything about it. Right. They, they are involved in the discussions. They do get to, 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 to see information in a, in a very controlled setting. And then they have to leave the room. And if they don't like what they, they see, they have to sort of seethe in frustration because uh, they feel like they have no teeth as overseers. They, they don't have any authority to, 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 to do anything with this uh, information. And there have been plenty of frustrated uh, members of the committees. And there's a lot of, of, of intelligence scholars who think that this is, is, is oversight without teeth, that, it, that it's really sort of meaningless. I look at it in a slightly different way, uh, which is to say the patterns of oversight have changed in important ways historically. I mean, if you look at, at oversight in the 60s and early 70s versus oversight since the 1980s, um, it, it's, there's much more, many more eyes on the intelligence community than, than there used to be. Right? And quite frankly, you don't see the kind of intelligence abuses that you did see in the 60s and 1970s. For all of the controversies about what, what has gone on with the NSA, um, it is frankly nothing like the 1960s. You want to see intelligence misbehavior, I can show you intelligence misbehavior. Right? You want to see actual targeted surveillance of, of American citizens, I can show you that for all of the wrong reasons in a period where congressional oversight was much more lax. So it, it does beg the question, why have the intelligence agencies done a better job of, of staying within, within their lanes uh, and, and I, I think performing more responsibly over time, though not perfectly. So why have they done this? Part of the reason may be that they are deterred by the structure of oversight that's in place. They know that they have to, to reveal information to a, some number of, of, of Congress people and staff who are going to have that. right? Whereas in the past, there were quite a lot of, of, of Congress people who didn't want to know anything about it. Right? The fact that there are Congress people who know and that who may have a little, little too much to drink and reveal information may serve as something of a deterrent right? uh, to, to misbehavior. But let's be clear, the misbehavior of the 60s and 70s isn't the same as the misbehavior of the last uh, 10 years, in part because the technology wasn't the same. You, we were not capable of that sort of behavior in the 60s and 70s in terms of the sweep and scope oh, sure. of, of opportunities. Oh, I think it would have been much worse. I mean, had, had the intelligence community of the late 60s had the technological capabilities that the intelligence community has today, look out. But that's my point. They didn't. Yeah. And so yeah. when we compare the 60s to now, uh, and we talk about the types of things we're regulating, the types of things we're overseeing, we're not talking about the same things. And so when we talk about what constitutes misbehavior, right. we're, we, are, we have to be careful to, to think, are we really talking about the same sort of thing? Yeah, no, no, I understand your point. And just, just to clarify, we're in a position now where the intelligence community has many more capabilities than they ever did in the past, but they're not using them. Right? Which to me suggests that there is something effective happening with oversight and self-reporting. And how do you know? Through, through, no, I, mean, I know because I'm a social scientist, and I've viewed the evidence over the last 50 years. And, and no, no, how do you know you have all the asking, evidence? I think he's asking a different question. I think you're answering the question, how do you know that there's more capability now? But I think the question that Jeff's really trying to get at is, how do we know that these capabilities are not being used? Especially since, to go back to, to Jeff's, one of his initial points, we're only having this discussion because of a criminal because of a leaker who has violated American law. 
It seems to me that the analogy that you used of driving the car is both perfect and also frightening to many Americans. That if the car can go up to, not your driving, that no. if the car can go up. I wasn't up, driving. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if the car can go up to 150 miles an hour and you're telling us that, oh, that's okay, we won't. That's not comforting to all our people to know that, well, you could. You so, could go, yeah. go further if you chose. So, I mean, I think this is, again, where you talk about that trifecta, where you talk about the executive branch, both inside an agency like the NSA, with Department of Justice and ODNI, right, in there doing reviews. I'm happy to walk through with Congress, with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, in an area that Congress has said activities conducted under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, right, we have stated by passing that act that those are the activities we really want to focus on because we know the capabilities, the capacities. We know that right, it's important to have that constant level of compliance, that constant level of oversight, have it regulated by law. It, it, it really is, to borrow uh, you know, General Hayden's thing, it is sort of the Madisonian trifecta. Um, you, you, you bring up the technology point, and I think that is the, I mean, that is a lot where the rubber hits the road. Right? There's a lot of technology. I mean, if you actually look at the documents, there's a website called IC on the record, you can see that actually, um, in 2009, the NSA passed detailed technical drawings to the congressional committees. Um, that's another, I think, really interesting point, right? It, to, in an attempt to make sure that it wasn't just words on a page that was being used to describe our activities, but actually understanding how the lines flow, right? Where the, in this case, the metadata was. Well, now, what would have happened if someone in, the, this was classified material, I presume? At that time, class. yes. Right, so what would have happened if, if one of the congressmen had said, <laughs> I am truly passionately disturbed by this and believe I have a constitutional right as a member of the legislative branch and not the executive to take this to the American people. What would have happened to that person? Now, let me give, before you answer, let me give you an example. Oh, that's Congress, but that's right. Well, but, but you know, <laughs> I mean, in World War II, for example, yeah. there was a, a famous case of a congressman who revealed classified information. He revealed that Japanese depth charges launched from destroyers were simply exploding too high in the water for American submarines. And all we had to do was go 300 feet below and we're fine. And he says to the newspaper, don't worry, our boys are fine. They just have to dive low because the Japanese aren't dropping them low enough. And guess what happens? Okay. Interestingly enough, that person was not prosecuted. He was ridiculed and he certainly wasn't reelected. Uh, but there was no crime in that because the executive and the legislative were not sure who had the the right authority here. So what happens in that scenario? Lawyer, tell me, what happens in that scenario? Well, what happens is you see the operation of structure. Sometimes you want there to be crime, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you want, for instance, a speech and debate clause uh, in our Constitution so that you cannot be prosecuted for what you say on the House floor or the Senate floor. Now, I don't know where that lunatic said that, uh, but I'm delighted he wasn't reelected. But that's a slightly different question. We're not always necessarily talking about uh, the time our ships are setting sail or the, the, the depth that the depth charges go. Uh, and it's sometimes conceitedly very difficult to know when we're talking in those terms and when we're not because it's unclear by revealing what in a mosaic of information uh, we are revealing uh, uh, things that can help our adversaries or in some cases our allies. Uh, but the fact is you've got that structure. Uh, now in the trifecta, the Madisonian trifecta that we were talking about before, notice that most of the agencies that were listed were executive agencies. ODNI, DOJ, the executive branch, the president, the White House. Uh, you have Congress, but as we've been talking already, what's oversight and what's sufficient oversight is quite contested. You've got the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, but that's a court that doesn't meet in open session, the way our courts normally work. It doesn't meet in an adversarial posture, the way our courts normally work. And so what you have is a Madisonian trifecta where you've knocked the edges off two of the pyramid uh, corners. And the third pyramid corner, for very good reason maybe, says you've got to trust us to develop a culture of compliance. You've got to trust us to use this authority with care. And knocking off those corners is OK, because we're going to give some oversight. We're going to have some reporting. And if we go too far, 
uh, that will be the signal that we should rein it in. And so uh, you, you talk about the creation of your office in 2009, uh, and today uh, or yesterday we are um, given, uh, thanks to some Freedom of Information Act requests, two of the opinions that were issued by that closed non-adversarial court which, by the way, was set up under the FISA, which, by the way, was set up to deal with the Soviet menace. Soviets in the United States that we needed to uh, surveil and follow and listen to, uh, and it has now been repurposed uh, for other adversaries with other technologies. Uh, but, but those documents reveal that uh, Judge uh, Caller Catelli, uh, then on the FISC, and Judge Bates, later on the FISC, uh, accuse, and we have no idea how to assess the validity of the accusation, uh, the, um, uh, the intelligence uh, organizations of uh, non-compliance with FISC orders and with uh, uh, submitting documents that were untrue in the words of Judge Bates. Now, we know about that now. I'm in no position to know internally how effective uh, those uh, opinions were in reining in the, um, uh, the, the NSA. Uh, I have no doubt that there were corrective measures put in place, the existence of your position being a very good one. Uh, but whether that's adequate oversight and adequate uh, structural protection, uh, I think is a very open question. Uh, and in my opinion, not what Madison had in mind. Uh, just very quickly on, on this point about how you judge the quality of oversight, which is a very difficult question, it's, and it's inherently hard to do when you're talking about oversight of secret organizations. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so that, that's not my frame of reference, but, 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 I, but I'm, a, I'm a political scientist again, so I look at outcomes. Right? And one interesting outcome has been the behavior of Senator Wyden. I think it's a very interesting case study in all this. Senator Wyden, a sharp critic of the NSA, one of, one of the people who was most concerned about what was going on in, in the agency, and expressed, it was clear if you, if you watched him before the revelations happened, he was clearly uncomfortable, and he was very suggestive that there was something wrong, but he didn't reveal it in public, and, and, and it turns out that the substance of his, his criticism was a difference of legal interpretation. Right? It wasn't criticism that what the agency was doing was outright illegal or horrible or unethical. It was that he didn't like the legal interpretation of, of how they were, they were operating. Now, to, to me, this, this suggests that oversight is a working fairly well. If you have the most, or one of the most strident critics, who happens to be a very responsible lawmaker, who, who is staying within his lane, um, and his biggest criticism is a difference of legal interpretation. And it suggests to me that, that the reporting that's coming out of the community um, and, and their concern over, uh, 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 about congressional overseers is actually working quite well. But Josh, don't underplay it. That's a whole ball of wax. If what we're talking about is legal authority reigning in important but sometimes dangerous powers, and what we're talking about is a difference in, uh, in interpretation of how far that authority goes. That's everything. For example, if two people, a congressman and an intelligence official, disagree about what the word collection means, does it mean you can collect everything and collection only occurs when you look in the haystack? Or does collection mean you gather it up? That's the whole ball of wax. So I, 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 I as a lawyer, uh, don't want to underplay that uh, at all. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, fine. Can it's I just, the whole please, just, yeah, please, just the ball of wax. I don't quite it's understand the, the ball of wax, yeah. but, but I, I do want to. Uh, who um, gathers wax and yeah, balls? Yeah, I don't know who gathers wax and balls. <laughs> um, we don't know. We don't know, right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Put it all together. Um, that's fine. But actually, I think we do know, right? I mean, that's sort of the point in why we're all here is that we do now know a whole lot more. And you know, to, to play off of Shasha's thing, when you read the documents, you find a couple things. Let's just point those out. Right? You find that in 2009, right, there were disconnects between the documents, between NSA's activities. Those were identified, reported up. Right? NSA was a learning organization, an accountable organization. It established this office. Um, it had a compliance wing, but it was within one of the, its business units. 
Um, we've actually quadrupled the folk, number of folks, nearly the quadrupled the number of folks working in compliance. to over 300 folks. I don't think many people understand that. Um, I mean, think about a regulated entity and think about 300 people working in compliance. Think about the degree of, and I can tell you, I've been in these checks and balances that we've talked about. I've been in these oversight meetings. Right? There are teeth. There are wire brushings that occur. Um, right? I've been in front of the court. Um, this is this is you know this is serious oversight. To your point, structure and time and that right, we may evolve. We always have. Even the FISA um, Act was amended in 2008. It was renewed. Even the Patriot Act was amended and renewed. So you know these, especially renewals and amendments and those kinds of things, are a natural way that we kind of go through another you know another relook, um, not just within the executive branch, but in the um, congressional branch and in the um, courts. Just a, a little coda on this. Um, I think technology is really, especially we're in the Lyle School of Engineering, um, technology really is part of the discussion. Um, it gets to that, you know, maybe my, uh, you know, speedometer thing, you know, hopefully it was meant to inform and not inflame, but, um, uh, but technology is something. It's revolutionized our lives, right? It's, it's changed. It's not just an NSA thing. It's an everybody thing. Um, you know, and our response to that, um, I think it was Arthur Schlesinger said, you know, technology, Revolutionar revolutionizes our lives, but um, you know, myth and uh, history and or something else kind of frames our response. Um, and I think a lot of that is, you know, the, the, we talked about pendulums, we've talked about all these things. I don't know the right ball of wax. I don't know whether that's the right one either. Um, but I think a lot of this is making sure we have a discussion, make sure we have a, with the facts, with the, right, with the completeness, to make sure we do approach these things in a methodical, thoughtful way. Um, one, one, one quick follow on to all this, just to add one more metaphor because we don't have enough yet. Um, <laughs> it, it, we can get a few. With, 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 with respect to, to technology, um, we don't uh, inherently accuse policemen of misbehavior simply because they have handcuffs. Right? We need to see evidence that they're misusing those handcuffs in order to, to judge them harshly. I have not yet seen serious evidence of NSA misbehavior. Right? I'm, I'm waiting to see victims. Right? And, and when I see victims, as, again, as a, as a social scientist, then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll be a little more concerned. And the, the, the other reason to, to, to think in these terms is instead of looking at this problem from the position of the congressional overseer, right, you can, I can understand why they'd be frustrated by their, their, their inhibitions here. Imagine um, being a senior intelligence official, some, some, somebody like John. Right? Um, I would be terrified of misbehaving, given, given the, the, the nature of Congress, given, given the nature of, a, of, of a, a sprawling and very aggressive press, right? not just a couple of newspapers like the old days, but a free-for-all with, 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 with really aggressive bloggers and, and, and TV and radio and, and traditional news media. I would be very, very nervous about, about going too far. I would assume that things would leak. In the old days, in, in, in the 50s, there was a, a rule of thumb regarding covert action. Right? And the rule was, assume that your covert action is going to be publicly revealed. Assume that, it, that your operation will be blown. Then ask yourself, are the benefits of this operation worth the risks of revelation? Right? I would imagine that this same ethos is going on today, and it's even more intense given the nature of, of the media environment and given the nature of Congress today. And I'm, I, history might prove me wrong, but that, that, that I, I think that's probably going on. Well, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for all of you <clears throat> to ask questions. So we have microphones that are going around. Now, let me stress one thing here, <clears throat> and that is that we are here to celebrate democracy. Uh, we are here to uh, hopefully safeguard democracy, but we are not necessarily here to practice democracy. <laughs> So, uh, Sounds like a classroom. <laughs> it does. Exactly. I will uh, channel, my, channel my inner Genghis Khan and ask you to uh, limit yourselves to questions. So, if you would, uh, raise your hand and uh, Professor Eads, have a. Okay, but I'm going to have a pre preliminary remark, which is this is one area. And those who know me will find this hard to believe. I don't know what I think. Um, OK. <laughs> so like Josh, um, I don't respond to your idea that it's thinking about strategic and that well, you think these people aren't doing this and aren't doing that. Because my liberty is too important for that assumption. And Jeff, I don't 
respond to the idea that we have to parse it so finely that they may not be able to use some of these things to prevent the Boston Marathon bombing. And so my question to you, Joe, is what in you, beyond the legalisms, beyond the parsing of words, what are your moral and ethical views on when you're making a decision as to whether or not you should look at me by using your technology or someone like me? Sure. Um, so it's not moral and ethics that starts that discussion. It's law and policy. Um, so that, that is very clear. Um, there are very, if, if you're talking about you as an American citizen, is that what you're? I'm asking you as the decision maker. So, I, so NSA does not make the decision about what law and policy is, what regulates it. So I just want to make it clear, right? This is, I can only be as clear as I can be. <laughs> the procedures that NSA operates under are approved by the Attorney General. Okay, for activities regulated by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, they are approved also by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. They all stem, of course, right, from statutes, from executive orders. So, that sounds right. like following orders. That's a problem I have. No, no, so I, I, I want to separate what the law and the procedures are, right, from what orders are. Now, right, where do the, where do the orders, where, does our, where do we take our guidance? That was my second thing. So I talked about law and policy, right, so to target a U.S. citizen, a U.S. anywhere, under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, you have to go to the court and get a probable cause order. Right? That's clear. In terms of what drives NSA's activities, right? what drives NSA's activities are the intelligence needs of policymakers and military commanders. Right? Let's be clear about what those are. We and this uh, one of our one of our folks was out. Thirty-six thousand pages. 11,000 distinct things that deal with many of the things that Josh and other folks were talking about. Right? What's going on in this area of the world? Right? What's those kinds of things? They are foreign intelligence. Right? We do have, and as you, you know, and we talked about, there are some programs that have been put in place right, since 2001 and, and on to close that seam between foreign actors who would seek to project into the United States Right? and those kind of connecting the dots type things. Right? So those are, for example, the business record of the 215, the bulk telephony metadata program, right? where it's just metadata, it's not anybody's voices, it's not my voices, it's not the terrorist's voices, it's literally numbers of who called whom. Right? That is put in a lockbox, and you look at it with only very specific things in a soda straw. So I want to make sure people understand that. There's both law and policy, but then there's what the foreign intelligence needs are. And those are foreign intelligence needs, right? They're not domestic intelligence, they're foreign intelligence needs. Um, you can count them a variety of ways, like I said. Right? There, are, there are more demands than probably we can supply. Um, and that's another thing that constrains us is budget, is resources, is the ability to make sure we satisfy those. Um, you asked, you started your question, so I'll answer with my, um, which is kind of morals and ethics and that, and I can, you know, you mentioned culture of compliance. It's not just compliance. It goes beyond. Um, I've been there since before 9-11, and I can tell you there's not an analyst at NSA that likes to come across a U.S. person. They don't, right? We've been trained from day one that our mission is a foreign intelligence mission, right? Does it occasionally happen that two foreign nationals are talking about a U.S. person? It does, right? and that's why we have attorney general minimization procedures of kind of not a household term, but privacy protecting procedures that say, here's how you have to deal with it. And so to you know, bring rubber to the road, it might be that that just goes away. We completely ignore that, right? Or if a terrorist is in fact talking to a US person and that is really necessary to understand the foreign intelligence, then I actually think I'd sit here even as the director of compliance and say, I think our nation would probably want to know something about that, right? A terrorist who seeks to harm us is in contact with a US person, we're targeting the terrorist. We got to do something with that. Typically, we will pass that off to the FBI, right? Such that that is then dealt with through the appropriate legal channels with the appropriate structural agency that's been assigned, right? Protections within the United States. Does that does that help with your question? But let's be clear. Yeah. When John said to do certain things, I've got to go to the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and get a probable cause order. You might have thought to yourself, oh, well, that's kind of like getting a warrant, but. What probable cause? Probable cause for what? Not probable cause that a crime has been committed or, or is in the process of being committed, which is in a regular court of law, what you would 
seek a, a warrant for. But probable cause that the target is a foreign agent or sufficiently connected to a foreign agent. Probable cause of that. So it's, it's again, forgive me for loving wax, it's all, it's all in those words. Uh, now, talk about the guidelines. The guidelines are, are, first of all, all within the executive branch. Second of all, they're guidelines. They're not statutes. Guidelines can change. Guidelines have exceptions. What is the standard of review that an analyst uses to determine whether uh, to bring a case forward? It is that there is an articulable, reasonable suspicion of the various factors involved uh, that would warrant a nomination. Reasonable articulable suspicion is the lowest standard of review known to the law. It's just above a hunch. It's not, uh, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not preponderance of the evidence. It's not, it's not uh, probable cause. It's below probable cause. Last point, the culture of compliance. I have no reason to uh, disbelieve what you say, and I'm very glad to hear it. All of the individuals that I talk to in government for my book and work, uh, I came away thinking these are hardworking men and women who believe very strongly in their mission and want to do good. But they have an institutional bias, which I mentioned in my opening remarks. Do you want to be the analyst who makes a mistake, not in terms of targeting a US person, but in not targeting a person? And if you are buried layer upon layer of multi-agency, multiple analysts, do you want to be the weak link in that chain? And I think of what David Addington, the uh, advisor to uh, the Vice, Vice President Cheney, once said uh, to Jack Goldsmith, as reported in his book. Jack Goldsmith, now a Harvard Law professor, but then Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel. He said, pointing his finger, if you rule that way, the blood of the next 10,000 people who die in a terrorist attack is on your hands. Now, if that conversation is happening at that level, what sort of a conversation happens where the rubber hits the road? Very quickly on this point, David Addington is prone to exaggeration and hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you are familiar with him? He's, 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 a, he's an outlier. Um, he really is. He's, 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 he's a very aggressive character, and, he, and he's some prone to... to, to, to Unfortunately, he's, vivid not, he's not here to offer a defense, so it seems <laughs> good for me. It's ex parte. Yeah, yeah, yeah ex parte. No, but I, one issue, I think, just to, to, to sort of frame this debate, um, is that there is a, a fundamental difference between intelligence and law enforcement, right? Um, the, the, law enforcement is primar prim primarily what happens after a crime has been committed. Right? You, you, you go beyond a reasonable doubt when you're trying to convict somebody in a court of law. There are d a different higher evidentiary standards because it suits a different purpose. Intelligence agencies operate in, for, for different purposes. They're supposed to provide information to policymakers uh, so that they can make responsible uh, national security policy. So the, the evidentiary standards are lower. And this gets at the crux of this problem, the crux of the dispute. Because when you're dealing with actors who are both uh, working, they're foreign actors, but they have some link to the United States, figuring out where the line between intelligence and, and law enforcement is, is extremely difficult. There's no simple solution to this problem. And just one, one other point on this. Recall that after 9-11, the, 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 the major point of criticism of the intelligence community is that it had not figured out how to close the seam between international intelligence and domestic law enforcement. And this is, is what went wrong. So we were told by the 9-11 Commission and others. This was the seam in which the terrorists were, were operating. So I'm trying to understand the last, the last dozen years of intelligence uh, actions which to me look like real efforts to close this seam while also taking steps like creating a compliance office so that they don't go too far. Next question. Uh, yes, in the back there, please. Yes, you. I, I want to make it as difficult as possible for the microphone to get to you. <laughs> <clears throat> so. Now, okay, so regardless of whatever has happened with the NSA, um, it did happen, and obviously there's been an international uproar. And my question um, is really about what's going to happen. I mean, what do you foresee happening with the NSA um, in response to this uproar? And 
if anything, do, um, do you think the NSA will um, simply just let it die down, or what kind of actions are you guys taking? Is the government taking? I know that's a really broad question. Sure. Um, in response to everything. Sure. So I don't think the NSA will let it die down. I mean, that that's not NSA's decision. Um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, so. It, it's a great question. Um, you know, I have no crystal ball. I don't think anybody in this room has a crystal ball. Um, you know, what are, what are we committed to? Um, and, and I think if you look at um, probably the core issue is confidence, right? We, we, the confidence of the American people is very, very important to us, right? We have lived in a world of secrecy. Um, and I think confidence in, in NSA really, um, if you were to look at it, really comes from kind of three things, one of which is, you know, historical secrecy, and that created a lot of, um, you know, people filled void. There's always a vacuum filling that goes on when there's any kind of secrecy. Um, the second is, and I think we're talking about this right now, there's, there's still a lot of, and I think you, you mentioned it, I don't even know how to feel, right? That kind of, there's, there's partial information, there's maybe some confusion of things, there's a difference between capability versus what's actually done. There's questions of compliance and oversight. These are all important questions. And maybe there's a third thing, which is kind of, this is something that we know is, you know, the digital, the technology change is something that has occurred to date and will occur in the future. Um, and so NSA is sort of maybe the, the um, pinprick in that, if you will, that, that launched this. And um, in terms of NS, what NSA is doing, um, and, and really it's, it's broader than NSA, it's really the administration. Um, and you even see it from Congress and the courts. Um, we're trying to get a lot more information out. There's a document, or there's a website called IC on the Record, um, which actually has documents that's been released, um, managed by the Office of Director of National Intelligence. So we're trying to do that. We're trying to do things. Um, you know, part of understanding NSA is just knowing NSA, realizing there's actually living human beings like me and others that that um, are dedicated and you know. Um, really trying to focus on being responsive to law and policy, understanding um, the priorities of our, um, the folks who regulate it, making sure we're accountable. Um, I think we're also gonna have to, and we know this, and our director said this in a lot of the public testimony, which me and others helped write, so um, <laughs> we're talking to the right person, um, is to make sure we also push out not just documents that, that stem from what's being discussed today because of the last revelation, um, but we push out actually just more information as a matter of course. Um, so for example, you know, I'm, I'm from the compliance office, I run the compliance efforts, we're working on a public annual, we're thinking annual report that basically says, here's what our compliance program looks like, here's what our compliance transactions look like, right? here's a few things where we made some mistakes, let's be accountable to you, those kinds of things, because I think NSA is, and we, and we very much recognize this, we're very much open to being more transparent about that. Um, I'm sorry. Let me ask you a follow-up on that, and, I, and I'd like you to answer in the passive voice so we don't have to attribute it to you. Oh, um, <laughs> I think that we're long past that. Well, are there, are there elements within the NSA and within the intelligence community more broadly who are saying to themselves, you know, we don't like the way he did it, but thank goodness Snowden came along so that we can have these broad philosophical debates in the open forum so that whenever we move forward, we will do so with greater public understanding, greater public endorsement, greater public discussion. So I don't know how to use the past pluperfect exactly right. Um, <laughs> I think that's the right, the right, I took Latin for a long time. Um, so, you know, I think it's important. We can separate the discussion of, you know, this being a good discussion from, you know, an unlawful act that, that spawned it. That's, that's, I think, important to separate. Um, you know, I, I uh, especially from compliance, um, you know, I, I started actually over a year ago being out in the media. I did some Fox News interviews. I, I did NPR and that. And um, for me, it was actually a little bit difficult because I could talk about our compliance regime, but I could, or couldn't talk about the rules of the road, if you will, um, because those were, those were classified. So it's been a little easier for me to talk about it. That's just me. Um, but I think in the end, um, you know, the, the, there's the rules and then there's the reason behind the rules and there's a public confidence in the rules and knowing that the rules that are out there and the, and the priorities have the support. Um, you know, and again, we're a democracy, so we all will have different opinions about everything, right? We're never gonna get everyone in a room to agree on everything. But to the degree to which we have the public's confidence, we have the nation's confidence, we have Americans' confidence, that these are the right rules, these are the right priorities, this is how they want their NSA to work, um, there's only good that comes from that. Um, really only good. Um, I, 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 
I, I think to answer the question just briefly about whether or not the agencies will be comfortable and, and actually excited about having more of these discussions really depends on what happens as a result of these discussions. Right? I, I think that if you see a pattern of, of discussions like this, I, I think this has been terrific, that, then, then people will be generally satisfied with it. Right? But if the discussions turn incredibly hostile, if they lead to, to, to radical uh, reform, which is pushed, to, pushed through too quickly, if they cause um, analysts to flee government service because they don't like the feeling like they're being abused, well, then the lasting memory of this whole episode will be undoubtedly negative. Mm -hmm. right? so, so, so a lot depends on, on, on how discussions like I, this know, play I, out. That's, that's, that's not right. Uh, because the lasting memory of the church commission was that, boy, it was a good thing. We got rid of some bad elements. We got rid of people who couldn't handle greater oversight and couldn't handle greater public scrutiny. So yes, the initial years after Vietnam were, were difficult for the IC, but in the long run, aren't we glad it happened? The, the, the record of the Church Commission, I think, is mixed. In some senses, the, 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 the reforms that came after the Church Commission were, were thoughtful and right, but there were very negative effects from that as well. There was an exodus from, from the intelligence community. It was, very, it, it was a very unpleasant place to work, uh, in, in, especially in the late 70s uh, and, and early 80s from my interviews with, with people. So you know, there were consequences of this. The other thing I'll say about the Church Commission, which, which happened in 1975, is that that commission and those debates were in, in, in response to serious intelligence misbehavior. I mean, things far beyond what we're talking about today. So the ferocity of the debate, I don't think was driven by, by domestic politics so much as driven by just how bad the intelligence agencies had behaved. Whereas today, it's less clear that they've really misbehaved. People are concerned that they have, have, have interpreted their, their authorities too broadly and were not comfortable about their new capabilities, but it's simply not the same. I mean, just, you know, there are, there is a line, and this is always, everything is a balancing act in life. Um, you know, there are sources and messages. There are things NSA does that really do, do need to be kept secret, right? There are, I mean, there, such, there such are those things. Such as. Such as. <laughs> right. That was a joke. That was a joke. Okay, got it. Oh, you want to know? I brought, I, brought, I brought some of them. I thought we could review them right now. Um, so. No, but I mean, I just, you know, that, and I think, you know, to play off your point, um, if, if the discussion starts turning into, well, let's describe everything, even the sensitive sources and methods that keep this nation safe, that keep military members overseas safe, you know, those are the things that really, um, you know, do, do provide a counterpoint. So, you know, I, I like everything in life. It's a bit of a balancing act. It's a ball of wax, maybe, is the, the best way to say on, it. On a pendulum. <laughs> pendulum. Another, another question. Uh, sir, right here, please. Thank you. I, uh, I wanted to say I'm not as probably concerned as maybe a lot of people in this room about what the NSA does, uh, partly because I was probably your best customer. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think you can have a discussion about compliance external to the, law, the laws that you're talking about without having a discussion about the protection within the organization uh, and the fact that a guy like Snowden as a contractor uh, who had a sword background before he came in was not really analyzed as probably a good person to be in that contractor role. So, you know, the challenge I think the agency has is to, and I'm sure you're doing copious amounts of review on this now, um, but, uh, you know, to look at these contractors, and, and I, I talked to Admiral McConnell since he was, it was his contract, but, um, you know, how does somebody get through the process without having the scrutiny that they ought to have? So, a, a great question. A um, couple things I would say is obviously, you know, the actions of one contractor shouldn't be imputed to all contractors. So, it's not just a contractor thing. It, you know, there's a, there are folks taking a hard look at the clearance process, moving to more of a kind of continuous review, and, and there's been some public statements we've made on that. Um, I, I do think it is important, um, we, we talk about compliance, there's kind of compliance and security, they're very related, um, but really what, what we're talking about is the distinction between access to documents and access to the data that NSA collects. Those are two very different pathways. They're not unrelated in the sense of, obviously there's people involved and there's technology involved, but you need a different set of locks and keys 
to get into our collected data, for example, the telephony metadata program we've been talking about. My guess is it's much the same as a university like this where you have student records which are kept much different from the, you know, what's our strategy for the next five years, right? What's, you know, where's the next, you know, faculty lunch tomorrow, right? You know, those, those kinds of kind of running the business, um, you know, and so NSA kind of as, as part of the 9-11 um, push as well, it wasn't just about sharing data, it was about sharing technologies and capabilities and hey, I'm working over here, I, I've solved an analytic problem with this technique, I think you over here should know that. There's no collected data involved in that, that's just, um, so I, you know, there is, um, I, I want to kind of, you know, let, let people understand the difference between you know, access and what was taken of collected or of uh, documents, PowerPoint slides, Word documents, et cetera, and then actually the locks and keys and the auditing and the oversight and the compliance that's done for things that for us are incredibly sensitive, governed by those attorney general regulations. And much like a, a student record, right, which you know, only a few set of folks can look at and their activities are audited and reviewed. So, but it's a great question. I don't know if you all have any. One possible, one possible ramification of the Snowden affair, one negative outcome could be that we raise standards for getting a clearance and keep peop good people out of the community. And this is, this is a, this is a long-standing problem in, in, in intelligence, is that, for instance, you need people who are, say, Arabic speakers or people who have friends and family in, in parts of the world that we care a lot about. Uh, those people have, um, over the last decade, often found it difficult to get a job in the intelligence community because uh, even though they are incredibly important for their language skills and their, and their friends and their knowledge, uh, they're also, they present perhaps a security risk. And one of, I, I've criticized the intelligence community for going too far in the direction of keeping people out. One thing that, that I fear is that because of the Stone Affair, they'll even go further in the direction of counterintelligence and, and excluding smart people with a lot of useful knowledge from, from this business. Other questions? Who are you pointing at? <laughs> uh, sir, back here. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah there's, there's been a recent report, uh, and I don't know whether it's true or not, so I'm going to ask you to verify whether it's true or not, is that there is a law or a document or some sort of authority that the NSA has or is able to get that they can go into a business that has large, large databases, telephone records, email records, and things of that nature, and demand that the organization provide the NSA the data that they want, and they are not permitted to talk about it. There is no defense for it. And if, in fact, the organization does try to stop it or defense it, they're, they're liable uh, to criminal penalties. One, if that's true, I would like to know if it's true. And secondly, if that kind of authority or that kind of capability exists within any U.S. organization, how can we as people trust an organization or a government that has that kind and executes that kind of authority? So let me try to dissect the question a little bit. Um, so. First of all, NSA has no unilateral direct access into the servers of U.S. companies. That story came out at one point. That was quickly scaled back to what maybe we're talking about. I'm not sure exactly the fact pattern, which is there does exist in the United States government and really in any nation a court-ordered, court-authorized intercept capability. So the FBI or the NSA or whoever else, really it's the FBI in this case, can go to a court, request a wiretap or a order under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and then that is then presented to a US company known as Lawful Intercept, known by a variety of things. That is not, um, you know, that is something that is written into the law, that is something that, and there's various pieces of that, I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm a compliance guy, not the legal guy, so you'll have to ask the legal folks, but, um, you know, th those are, those are, those lawful intercept capabilities, not just capabilities, but procedures exist within the United States. They exist in other countries. Um, one thing I would say is actually, the United States actually probably has a far more regulated and overseen lawful intercept capability than probably many other nations across the, the world, so. I think what yeah. you might be talking about yeah. are national security letters. National oh, okay. security letters. And Which it's, is not an NSA thing, by the way. Uh, not, <laughs> not an NSA thing, yeah. uh, which is a bit like saying uh, that there are other sources, methods, avenues besides the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. 
besides some of the things that are uh, the specialty of the National Security Agency. A national security letter is a form of subpoena. Uh, and in that sense, it is a court document. But it's an unusual court document uh, because a subpoena is not something that you go to the court and seek the way you would seek a warrant by making a certain proffer to a court and having a court decide whether you'd met or not met the standard. Spina is something that you write yourself and you send to the recipient demanding the information. And if the recipient wishes to contest it, can go to the court through which the subpoena is authorized. Uh, now, there was in the past more restriction, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was more restriction on what the recipient of a national security letter could do or say, to whom the uh, recipient could speak. Uh, and that caused a lot of anxiety because, of course, if you receive a national security letter and you run a business like Tor, for example, uh, you might want to talk to your lawyers. Have you just violated the, the law? by seeking to find out whether you need to comply with the national security letter. So that aspect of it has been, I don't know if you want to call it reformed or rolled back or improved, but there's no question that if you receive a national security letter, you are free to speak to your lawyers. You are free to speak to those you need to speak to to comply with the uh, national security letter. Uh, but there are uh, restrictions, for instance, on whether you can reveal to your customers that you have complied with the national security letter. Is that fair? Yeah, does that, does that, I mean, yeah, this, it, you might need to, that's an FBI kind of other question, I think. Uh, you know, actually right in the dead center here, if you don't mind. <laughs> thank you. For, I was, is that fair? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was um, thinking. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm an engineer by training, and uh, one thing I've noticed, I've noticed that people are spending so much energy on technology, and we saw Boston happen, we saw took about a decade to catch Osama. We are seeing uh, the, um, the uh, mall in Kenya. We are seeing quite a bit of confusion in the Middle East. Are we losing sight of the basic human intelligence and focusing so much on technology and ending up missing so much that is in between and we, get, um, we don't get what we're looking for at the end of the day? You want Strategic sure. No, th th this is this is a, a, a long-standing concern that because the technologies of, of technical intelligence gathering are so sophisticated and so impressive, we may over rely on them and and forget about old-fashioned uh, espionage, old-fashioned spying. Um, this uh, this predates the current war on terrorism. Though. This goes all the way back through, through through the Cold War, in which the vast majority of intelligence that was generated for policymakers came from technical sources, and principally sig signals intelligence, and not not uh, human espionage. There are reasons why this is always going to be the case. It's simply very difficult to 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 get human agents in these kinds of outfits. It's just hard to do. It's much easier to monitor communications and to work in against that kind of target than it is to place somebody in, in that kind of organization or to recruit them. And the, the problem is particularly hard now because um, organizations are more diffuse and they're smaller. It's not like trying to, to, to penetrate a big nation state. It's, it's, just, it's just hard to do. This, this problem, however, forces some, some creativity. Well, how do you overcome it? How do you avoid the danger of over-reliance on technical intelligence uh, collection when you yourself lack the capability to, to do human intelligence collection? Well, one way to do this is to develop foreign liaison, right? To develop very close ties with foreign intelligence services. And if they don't want to participate in that kind of sharing agreement, then you conduct surveillance on them, right? Again. This is a difficult policy decision, right? Is the information you seek that important uh, that you're willing to risk the diplomatic fallout of doing that kind of behavior, right? So I, 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 I think that the, the, the recent revelations about Angela Merkel are probably not the last we're going to hear about this as intelligence uh, uh, agencies try to work around this, this fundamental problem. We have time for just a couple more questions. Sir, you've already got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> My questions are about the FISA court. 
Uh, one, have we ever before in our history had a secret court? And secondly, what is the jurisdiction of the FISA court? What kind of matters can it hear? And thirdly, how are the judges appointed to the FISA court? And fourthly, who has jurisdiction <laughs> to the information that the FISA court uh, hears? You want me to start while... Uh... Go ahead, I'll, I'll fill in. One. Uh, what the, is the FISA court? It's a secret court. It just scares me. Uh, I, I think the first question was, has there ever been a court so secret in our past? The answer is no, but don't take too much solace because uh, there are lots of circumstances where even our regular courts would, for very good reason, meet in closed session uh, or deal with things ex parte, meaning without representation from the other side, or in camera, meaning uh, with the doors closed. Uh, so two, its jurisdiction is to uh, oversee compliance with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, and requests to uh, have uh, the use of the technologies that that act is supposed to uh, govern. Three, composition. Can I broaden it, two, or do you want to get to? Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. so it, it's not just to oversee compliance, but by the terms of various Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act sections, the government, NSA, et cetera, FBI, must go and actually affirmatively ask for, say, these are the activities we would like to do, these are the procedures that the Attorney General would rec, and then the court must approve those activities, review those activities. And those activities are specified in the Those activities are specified in the statute. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay, and so I just, I just, it's not just oversee compliance as if NSA figures out what it wants to do and the court oversees it. Right. There must be affirmative representations, and then the orders and approvals come in the context of those representations with procedures. Compliance is then assessed against those procedures, and obviously the statutes and every other thing. So it is composed. You were on a, you were on a roll, so keep going. It, it is composed by a appointment of existing Article III judges, meaning judges who have been nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate and commissioned. Uh, the Chief Justice of the United States nominate, uh, uh, appoints them uh, for, I think, it's seven-year terms. Yep, there are 13 of them. There are 13 of them. They must come from different parts of the country, so not all from Washington, but at least a certain number must live within, I think, it's 200 miles. Three must be within, uh, close enough in the sense of for exigent, you know, for emergencies, usually from the FBI, et cetera, that to come in that. on weekends. Are they or trial? Uh, they may be either. Um, generally, I think they're district court judges. There is a FISA Court of Review, which is composed of three appellate, I believe, appellate or district judges. Yeah, I can't and, and that's the last question you asked. Uh, its decisions can be uh, reviewed by the Court of Review, which is appointed in a similar fashion, but it's of a smaller composition. Uh, but unlike our Article III courts, which are in constant communication with each other across the courts and up and down the hierarchy all the way up to the Supreme Court, this court's uh, opinions until very recently were classified, closed, and even as revealed on the website that John mentioned, are severely redacted. Uh, so it's sometimes hard to use them. And what's been disturbing to a lot of lawyers has been that the regular way that we make law in a common law system slowly and by accretion can't happen in the same fashion. So, and then just on four, uh, two points. One is they are on the website. They are redacted in part because of sources and methods, because our descriptions contain descriptions of fact, descriptions of operational activities, and those are often reflected back in the court's orders and that. Um, so that's why you see some of the redactions. The, the second thing is the orders, and you, know, you, you raise um, um, very important things to discuss about roles of the court, roles of Congress, structure, right, those kinds of things. Um, as a matter of the FISA statute, um, those opinions of the court are provided regularly to the committees in Congress so that they also have, because it's important to understand the context of what, for example, the intelligence community is doing in the context of those opinions. But when you say and Congress, we're not talking about all Again, the members sorry, of Congress. according to, so each, and then each section has specific things that say, you know, these are, these are how often they go up, et cetera, with the reports, so. And, and a classic example of the anxiety uh, that is uh, being discussed in the legal community is that the, this court is in a sense making law too, but it's making it with far fewer players. Uh, uh, not the least to mention that it is a, an ex parte proceeding, so there's only one side being represented. Now that happens all the time in, in regular courts when you go for a warrant 
to search someone's home or arrest someone, the defense attorney is not there. But the defense attorney will eventually be there because the person will be arrested or the material will be seized or it will be used and then there will be an opportunity to contest. And so the frustration is that sometimes old precedents from the criminal justice system might be used. For instance, that standard I talked about, reasonable and articulable suspicion, comes from an old 1968 case involving a cop walking the beat and seeing two guys case a jewelry store. And so in those cases, when, when and here is my criticism, the NSA would like, or the DOJ would like a low standard of review, they pick those cases from the criminal law. But then uh, when others would make an analogy to the criminal justice system, we're told, now wait a second. We're not talking about prosecuting people for crimes. We're talking about national security. But wait, that standard comes from Terry versus Ohio. So, so if you, just real quick, if you look at the, for example, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, they had an open hearing. And there were some discussions of the court, which I think you know, might help inform, and some discussions of even, for example, a amicus or a, a person who might stand in for you know, the other side, if you will. So they, these are the discussions that are going on, um, you know, both in the, within the government and also um, in the public these days. So thank you for your question. Well, you know, we've actually managed to exhaust uh, the two hours allotted, though clearly not exhaust the topic. And I wonder, just before we leave, if, gentlemen, if there's any last word which you'd like to get across before we <laughs> depart, anything you haven't covered? You want to talk about the Church Commission some more? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have I, a dispute. Okay. Yes, please. No, just one thing. Um, first, thanks for having me here. Um, it's great to represent um, NSA. Uh, it's also great to be part of this discussion. Um, I, I, I would ask that obviously you, um, you read with a critical eye the way we do in any important discussion of, of national significance. Um, make sure there's, uh, you know, you're getting so all source of information, kind of to use the intelligence thing. Right? Use all the sources you have. Make sure you are looking at them. And I think, you know, the, um, it's been great here with the other panelists. Um, there are huge, um, important structural things to talk about. There are structural things that are in place. There, are, we have constantly evolved the structure through the past decades, and, you know, my guess is we will continue to do so over the next decades. And, and this is a, this is a very important policy discussion. So, um, thank you all. I just want to leave you with a thought from one Supreme Court justice in one case. In one of the first cases to come before the Supreme Court about a new technology in 1928 called the telephone, and whether you could tap into the wire and that constituted a search, even though you weren't breaking in or trespassing or anything, uh, the court decided in a case called Olmstead versus United States that that wasn't a search. Go ahead. And it took until 1968 for the court to change its mind and say that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. But there was a dissenting voice in that opinion in 1928, and it was Justice Brandeis who invented the right to privacy. And what he said is that, uh, and I'm trying to quote, uh, but I'll probably butcher it, people born to liberty are used to protecting liberty from invaders from foreign lands. But the real danger to liberty comes from well-meaning officials, full of zeal, but without understanding. And that, I think, is the issue. Anything? Hey, sorry. Okay. Well, thank you all indeed. And in particular, thank you for coming out and engaging this thank exercise you. in participatory democracy. Have a good night.